Uh, my name is Thomas Groom, and uh, I've been a professor of theology and religious education here at Boston College for many years. I served for 33 years in the theology department, and then most recently at the School of Theology and Ministry. And I also currently have the privilege of serving as the director of the church in the 21st century uh, here at Boston College. That's a new appointment for me. Um, since the 13th of March of 2013, the day of his election, Jorge Maria Pergolio, known now to the world as Pope Francis I, has heralded what I think may well be a new paradigm in the history of the papacy. Uh, I know the day is still young, and history alone, of course, will be the final judge of his legacy. And yet, from my perspective, at least from the very beginning, his pontificate has reflected a sense of a new day in both style and substance. His simplicity of lifestyle, his dispensing with the imperial trappings that have ironically been associated with the successor of Peter, is already the stuff of legends and a stark contrast to what we might expect of the Pope. Uh, the stories and examples are legion. Uh, one of my favorites is the, that he will oftentimes go down to the cafeteria in the Vatican and pick up a tray and uh, get in line to have his lunch and then sit not at a head table but at whatever table is open and have a chat with the workers there. In fact, I've heard a version of it that the first time he tried to do that in the cafeteria, of course, the people ahead of him in line all pulled back and said, Holy Father, you must go to the front. He said, no, no, I stay in line. They said, no, no, you must go to the front. You're the Holy Father. He said, no, no, I am the Pope and I stay in line. So it was the first time that he pulled rank in a while. In other words, this is not what we typically tr expect uh, from the papacy. Then recently after this momentous trip to Cuba, uh, which celebrated his good offices that had helped to reestablish diplomatic relationship, relations between our two countries, Pope Francis arrived, as you know, here in the United States on Tuesday, September 22nd. And until September 27th, that Sunday took the country by storm. Among other things, addressing a joint session of Congress, the first Pope to do so, and an assembly of the United Nations, with, which included some 150 heads of state. And as we gather here this evening, Pope Francis is hosting a synod on the family at the Vatican. And the initial reports, at least, are that there's great debates going on and even profound disagreements emerging around controversial issues regarding the family. In fact, a group of more traditional cardinals, shall we say, uh, wrote the Holy Father a letter complaining about the process, that there is something terribly wrong with the process at the synod. And indeed, from their perspective, there is something very wrong. Because in many ways, what Pope Francis has done, whatever else he has done, I believe he has lifted the embargo on the conversation. Uh, in other words, on discussing such topics, uh, on discussing such topics for marriage, the spiritual rights of LGBT Catholics in the church, and the possibility of divorced and remarried Catholics receiving the Eucharist. Uh, as any the Catholic theologian will readily tell you, to even raise those issues five years ago would have brought down the wrath of the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith upon you and the likely verdict that you are not an orthodox Catholic theologian, even for raising these questions. Now, they're in the morning paper and being raised at the Synod. So, with the embargo lifted on the, such conversations and in the aftermath of his historic visit uh, to this country of ours, um, we ask the question fresh, I think, what does Pope Francis' visit to our country mean for the Catholic Church in the United States? And indeed, what does it mean as we continue to imagine and forge the church of the 21st century? Uh, we're only 15 years into the new century, so I think we still have time. And tonight we're very fortunate to have a wonderful panel, three of Boston College's most renowned, beloved, and insightful theologians to take up the topic after Pope Francis' visit imagining the church of the 21st century. And while we're well aware of the reputations as fine, great teachers, fine scholars in our midst, and indeed it is redundant to say that they don't need any introduction, let me give them a brief one nonetheless. Professor, uh, Professor Ken Heim, Reverend Ken Himes, a Franciscan priest, is the former chair of the Department of Theology at Boston College and a renowned ethicist. Ken's special interests and expertise is in Catholic social teaching and the role of the church in American public life. 
He's a past president of the Catholic Theological Society of America. His most recent book, Christianity and the Political Order, received the first prize award in his category from the Catholic Press Association for 2015, Professor Ken Himes. Professor Catherine Carneal is the current chairperson. All three of them are, have either are or have been chairs of the theology department. Uh, Professor Catherine Carneal is current chairperson of theology and holds the Newton College Alumnae Chair of Western Culture. Catherine's specialization is comparative theology. Her research interest groups focus on theology of religions, the theory of interreligious dialogue. She's also the founding and managing editor of the book series, Christian Commentaries on Non-Christian Sacred Texts. Two of her most recent books are Women and Interreligious Dialogue and The Wiley Blackwell Companion to Interreligious Dialogue. And Professor Steve Pope is also a senior professor of theology here at Boston College, a former chair as well of the theology department and also a renowned ethicist. Steve's specialization and research interests are in Christian ethics and evolutionary theory, charity and natural law and Aquinas and Roman Catholic social teachings. And Professor Pope's latest book is entitled, A Step Along the Way, Models of Christian Service, just published this past April by Orbis. The format we will follow, so uh, Steve goes first, Ken goes second, Catherine will be like the bishop in the liturgical procession, uh, bringing, bring, again, the, in, the, in the formal, uh, uh, bringing up the rear. Uh, we'll, we'll, <laughs> we will, um, each of them has promised to speak for about 10 to 12 minutes or so. If they go over, I kick them under the table. They're, all three of them are long-suffering uh, friends of mine as well. Uh, they'll each speak for about 10 to 12 minutes from their own expertise around the topic. Uh, we'll follow with some cross questions to create conversation between them and among them. We will then give it over to you for a couple of minutes, for a few minutes, just for a buzz with, your, with a couple of neighbors to share your own reflections and thoughts and in, insights. And then we'll bring you back together for some closing conversation among you and with the panel as well. So, without further ado, let us begin. And I think it is Steve that's going first. And I, have, I thought I had an hour, but no. <laughs> Here's uh, your microphone. This, is this, no, it says it's it on. Okay? Too far away. Maybe. maybe. How's that? Can you hear me okay in the back? Okay? All right. I'll try to enunciate. Uh, so I think we've all been impressed with uh, Pope Francis in a variety of ways, especially his style. Uh, he's a charismatic person. Uh, he has an uncanny ability to unite the traits of gentility with being a prophet, and you associate the prophet with a little bit harsher uh, style, but Francis is so gentle in his style, he can say things that out of the mouths of other people would be offensive, but he seems to, to be able to be inviting and bring us in. I'm especially impressed with the way in which uh, young people here at BC and around the country have been taken with him in and touched by the kind of person that he is, and they can pick up on the fact that he's actually a genuine Christian. And uh, he has a way of bringing us in and feeling, uh, helping us understand that Christianity is a live option for society today in his person. But I think that's also a danger, um, that, that in our culture we might reduce him to being a kind person or a personality who is particularly affectionate and open, and so um, be misled and, and not think that what he's doing is more than what a popular celebrity is doing. So I'd like to look at a little bit, just very briefly, at what I think are some key theological and religious commitments that he has that are embodied in what he does. Um, and they're just bringing together some themes that I think there's a real coherence to what he's doing in his actions, which are always speak louder than the words, but the actions and the words cohere, and help to bring us into, I think, a new way of thinking about what it is to be Christian in our society today. So the heart of Francis's uh, piety and theology, teaching and action, is the virtue of mercy or compassion. And I think mercy you can think of as at the very center of everything he does and all of his 
particular commitments are reflections of how he embodies and, and wants to work out what mercy means in our world. And I'll, I'll put this in terms of six points, very, very compactly. But the first thing is Francis wants us to recognize that we are recipients of God's love. That we are, first of all, recipients of God's mercy. And from this experience of God's mercy, we experience also gratitude, and that gratitude inspires us to want to be merciful to others. But if we don't first recognize we're recipients, mercy becomes a duty that the haves exercise on the have-nots, and it becomes paternalistic and condescending. It becomes someone here helping someone down here. And what's pervasive in Francis's notion of mercy is that we all need mercy, and it's just about helping each other walk down the course of life together. So this is why, for him, gospel really is good news. It's the good news that we don't have to earn our justification and we don't have to earn our worth. It's given to us by the love of God. The second striking point of, of Francis's thought is the style it's communicated in. And this is that his style, to me, is profoundly affective rather than pri primarily cognitive or intellectual and abstract. He doesn't speak in legal categories. He speaks in personal categories. And he thinks that this experience of receiving mercy and of giving mercy is done paradigmatically in interpersonal encounters. Encounter is not about control. It's about listening and responding and learning together as friends. So I think this, this encounter of concrete persons in the difficulties of their lives and in the goodness of their lives sets the tone for the third important emphasis, which I think is that Francis has a very incarnational piety and spirituality and theology. By incarnational, I mean he sees God in the concrete, gritty realities of everyday life. He's not looking for God outside of human experience and human difficulties and the complexities of life. He says he looks for God on the streets. He, and he's frustrated. He said publicly he's frustrated with the job, primarily because the Swiss guard won't let him wander around the neighborhoods of Rome. In Philadelphia, he said to inmates at the prison he visited, and he's reflecting upon the Gospel of John's discussion of Jesus washing the feet of the disciples. He said, life means getting our feet dirty. And he's not afraid of the dirt. He doesn't try to draw a line, going back to the Gospels, between the pure and the impure, the clean and the unclean. He says, we're all unclean. We all need a good foot washing now and then. So this is the grittiness of life. And we see this in his recognition now in the Synod of Rome on the family, that families are complicated. Families have their difficulties. Every family has its own dysfunction. We just dysfunction in different ways. The question for him as an incarnational theologian is how do we find God in the complexities of our families? How do we share the love of God in those families, given who people are in all of our contingencies and weaknesses? This leads to a fourth ethic that I find, a fourth dimension of his theology, which is ethic, his ethic of accompaniment, a term he gets from the Jesuits, I think, very important for Jesuit refugee service, that you understand service in terms of accompaniment and not control and bureaucratic manipulation. But accompanying people means you're walking the way with them. You're not ahead, showing them, here's where we're going. You're not behind, simply following, bringing up the rear. But you're really with the people fully immersed in their condition, not afraid of being tainted, and not afraid of not having all the answers all of the time. That's part of accompaniment. This leads him, I think, to a deep respect for the plurality of Catholicism. To see that mercy has to be applied in different ways, in different circumstances. That people experience the love of God and the reality of Jesus in their lives in very different ways. So there has to be local adaptation of what mercy means from culture to culture. So this is why I think he wants bishops to have more of a say in how to handle issues of annulment in uh, marriages that um, have, have broken apart and in which people are seeking to find a way to be in union with the church again. It also indicates why he seems to be strong on wanting to recover the sub subsidiarity within the church. That is to say that we should think of the church 
as a place for dialogue, a place for local initiative, a place that empowers the agency of people, lay people all over the world, not a top-down imposition. And that's the reason why he wants a dialogue that can be very messy, as Tom was mentioning in his opening remarks. Disagreement and debate are part of a church that is complex. And he wants to accept the complexity and embrace it. The fifth point is that for, John, uh, for Pope Francis, mercy works across the board for all human beings at every stage of life. So I think in a way he's recovering what Cardinal Bernardin some decades ago called the consistent ethic of life. This is where he doesn't line up with any political agenda that's promoted by a party or any given politician in this country. He wants the protection of life, as Cardinal Bernardin put it, from womb to tomb, on the edges of life and in the center of life. He stresses the people that in our society tend to be invisible, the unborn, the severely demented, the refugee, and nature itself. He sees life itself, the ecological environment we live in that we're trying to preserve so that we can have future generations sustained on the planet. He says this as part of the ethic of life, not as a purely political issue, not just as a scientific issue, although it involves dimensions of both of those, but as a life issue. He rejects culture, warrior attitudes in the political sphere. This is a crucial contribution of Pope Francis. Mercy actually is involved in the world of politics. That's mind blowing. Because we haven't seen mercy in our political system. Mercy does, uh, designates weakness to people. For him, where mercy is power. It's the power that binds people together and enables you to love each other even though you disagree. So he's against polarization of all kinds, even though his appeal to dialogue actually gives rise to polarization. He's, it's part of the process for him to work for consensus. And last but not least, when he talks about politics as a framework for mercy as well as justice, he wants to make sure that we have a moral framework for politics. Politics should not be about power for its own sake, about manipulation and control, but power that serves the common good. This is where he's able to combine mercy with prophecy. The prophecy of someone who has a vision of the common good that can renew American democracy and democracy around the world where it can be renewed based upon human rights and respect for the dignity of every individual person. Thank you. All right. Ken. Good afternoon. Uh, I'm going to address three points uh, in my remarks about the visit of Francis and what comes after it for the future uh, in American society. My three points are, my first one is going to be picking up on something that Steve said about the, uh, the risks of a celebrity culture and the media hype around the papacy. Uh, the second is to talk about the spiritual hunger that the American response to Francis demonstrated. And third, I want to say a few words about the distinction between the person of the Pope and the office of the papacy. So my first point. American society is, by my reading, permeated by a cult of celebrity. The uh, distinguished historian and former head of the Library of Congress, Daniel Boston, once defined celebrity as someone who is famous for being famous. And that, it seems to me, explains a lot of what we see in American society. It certainly explains the Kardashians. Right? It explains reality TV stars. And finally, it explains many of the people who show up in the style and society sections of our newspapers. The mass media in this country can turn its spotlight on just about anybody, and the glare makes that person a celebrity. A study several years ago among the attitude, about the attitudes of incoming freshmen in American colleges reported that being famous actually ranked above making a lot of money and having a good family as life's goal. I think we have to be wary about the cult of celebrity and how it affects our view of just about anybody 
who gets caught in the media spotlight, including Pope Francis. Journalists love to say that they only report the news. They don't make the news. That is simply not true. The media can make the news by what they decide to cover. What picture gets put on the front page? What video opens the evening news? The media loves to hype a person and then loves to watch the chronicle of the fall of the same person. If you don't think that's true, just watch what happens to Donald Trump in the next few months. <laughs> During his visit, Pope Francis was all day, every day, on TV, radio, the internet, newspapers. Rarely has there been such coverage for a foreign visitor. Maybe Princess Diana was the closest case. But that suggests the problem. The media coverage itself becomes a story. Mm -hmm. And the cover coverage is not necessarily linked to the character, the message, or the deeds of the individual. It is about being famous, being a celebrity. I don't think for one moment Francis desires to be part of that cult of celebrity. But that does not mean he can avoid being drawn into it, even against his will. So for me, the concern is this. I'd like to have a church and a papacy where, quite frankly, the pope is not such a big deal. I like this pope, but I don't want the papacy to overshadow the church. I think that all the attention to Francis ratified a gravely mistaken notion that many non-Catholics and even some Catholics have, that the Pope is the Catholic Church, or at least the Pope is the most important person in the Catholic Church, and that Catholics all look to the Pope for how to live their lives. Now this may be because, quite frankly, I'm a fairly low church guy. I don't very much appreciate the clerical hierarchy although I'm part of it. But I actually think we need a lot less of the clerical hierarchy, not more of it, for the church of the future. I don't want to be a wet blanket on a, a celebratory mood, but I would welcome a church where the Bishop of Rome is a decent, smart, wise leader, but who is not in competition with Caitlyn Jenner for news coverage. My second point. Now that I've let you see my grumpy self, all right, <laughs> let me say there is a message, I believe, in the intention and the fascination with this pope. The message is that many Americans have a spiritual hunger, and they are looking for a way to give expression to it. The number of non-Catholics, non-Christians, who have been quoted as welcoming Francis and embracing his message of mercy, Steve's point, who embrace his care for those on the margins, who appreciate his calls for dialogue rather than conflict, it's a very impressive list of people. Francis speaks to our better nature, and millions of people were listening. That is all to the good. We are not a secular society, even if we have many people in this society who do not embrace organized religion. Even before the visit of Francis, and as his visit confirmed, there are many Americans who are, quote, spiritual but not religious. The hunger for transcendence is there, and many of the people who are on serious pilgrimages in American life are never going to walk inside a church, a synagogue, a temple, or a mosque. And that, it seems to me, is the challenge for us. A week or so ago, I came across an article in America Magazine, the Jesuit Weekly. It was by a young woman whose article asked the question, why do so many young Catholic adults find it hard to find a parish that is a home? This is something I have heard my entire life as a priest. 
that campus ministers exert so much energy and creativity and care in shaping a church on campuses that is inviting and helpful to college students. And then fairly quickly after graduation, those same students lose touch with the church. This May, I will be a priest for 40 years. I am not sure that after all those years, the church now is any better prepared to minister to young adults than it was in 1976 when I was ordained. There is a real spiritual hunger out there, but I am unconvinced that we as an institution are more capable now than before to respond to that hunger. I once asked a friend of mine, a fellow Franciscan, who had been a successful pa pastor in three different parishes, very different parishes, I asked him what was the secret of his success. With fairly characteristic modesty, he tried to dodge the question, but I pressed him. What was it about the parishes that you led that they were lively and vibrant, I asked, that the pews were filled with a broad mix of generations, ethnicities, educations, and lifestyles? Finally, his answer was simple and straightforward. He said to me, I try my very best to make good preaching the norm for every liturgy. I make a lot of effort to create an array of opportunities for people to serve other people. And I do my best to not get in the way of people who are led by the Holy Spirit. That conversation came back to me when I read that article in America because the young woman who authored it said that her research suggested that what young people said they missed most in parishes was good preaching and the opportunity to get involved in service to others. So the visit of Francis demonstrates to me that the spiritual hunger and the spiritual energy is out there. What remains an open question for me is whether this church can satisfy the hunger and channel the energy. My final point. If you look at the history of the office of the papacy, it is clear that most popes are shaped by the office they assume. Indeed, some popes have been virtually swallowed up by the office of the papacy. They lose themselves in trying to live up to some image or idea that they think the papacy has to be about. Then there are those popes who are not so much shaped by the office that they assume, but who shape it by the force of their personality and character. However, sometimes that shaping is not always in good ways, as attested by the papacy of Boniface VIII, with its grandiose claims of papal power and privilege at the turn of the 14th century. Nor was it shaped positively by Gregory XVI or Pius IX with their anxious and defensive reactions to modernity in the 19th century. Still other popes shape the office in their own period, but the influence is not lasting. I think Francis is clearly a man who is not overwhelmed by the office that he holds. His personality, his spirituality, his theological perspective is evident and it is distinctive from his recent predecessors. So the purpose, the person of Francis is shaping the office of the papacy in his lifetime and ours. His insistence on a simpler, less aristocratic lifestyle for the clergy, his stress on mercy in pastoral care, even without doctrinal reform, his conviction that the church must be close to the poor, his interest in financial reforms within the church, and perhaps most significant, his commitment to a more collegial, more open, and dialogical way of proceeding in the governance of the church are all noteworthy aspects of his personal way of life and how he's casting or recasting the office of the papacy. 
But will this particular shaping of the papal office last beyond Francis? That is a question I don't think any of us can answer at this time. Perhaps if he serves long enough to make a significant number of appointments to the Episcopacy and the College of Cardinals, he will ensure some lasting effect of his style of papal leadership. If he should serve for a short period of time beyond the present moment, then I think it is indeed an open question as to just how much the person of Francis, as attractive, as inspirational as it is, I think it's an open question whether he will affect the office of the Bishop of Rome for a future church. Thank you. So much, Ken, and now Catherine. So um, I uh, was asked to speak uh, this evening about uh, Pope Francis and his role in interreligious dialogue, and uh, in particular in relation to his visit also. Um, as you heard from Tom, this is my field of interest, and so I follow that aspect of his papacy, of course, maybe more closely than, uh, than other dimensions. Um, the, Yes. Three. Now, now you're here. Thank you. Um, so, uh, in light of um, uh, Pope Francis's uh, engagement with uh, with other religions, I think we have seen from the very beginning of of his papacy. Uh, how he attaches a lot of importance to interreligious dialogue, both in, in uh, terms of his example, maybe mostly in terms of his example, but also somewhat in terms of his teachings. So uh, I th I'm sure we all remember when he was uh, barely elected, how he went and washed the feet of a Muslim uh, young girl, how he went to Rome together with uh, Rabbi Skorka, his friend, and prayed together at the Wailing Wall and embraced also a Muslim friend. So all of these uh, expressions of openness and engagement of other religions, I think, are very important and very important symbolically also for the world today. Um, uh, another event that happened that, hasn't, that didn't get quite as much attention was when he went to Sri Lanka and sort of uh, without being prompted or, or it being part of his program, he entered a Buddhist temple and stayed there for a considerable amount of time. So clearly this is a pope who is uh, open to other religions, interested in other religions and engaged, uh, engaged with them. Uh, and the history of the Catholic Church with regard to interreligious dialogue is somewhat checkered. Uh, uh, Vatican II really opened the doors towards interreligious dialogue, but since then there have been a number of events and documents that have been published that have sort of raised suspicion, uh, both among Catholics and among, among believers of other religions, whether the church really is interested in dialogue. And that, that's why I think Pope Francis's example uh, is so important. Uh, three um, events during his visit uh, to the United States, I think, were particularly significant. Of course, uh, the prayer meeting at Ground Zero, above all, where he met together with leaders from other religious traditions, and they each said prayers from their own tradition in their own languages, and then also uh, translated into English. And I wasn't present, but from what I hear and read, the uh, experience of, of joint silence among these uh, religious representatives where they just each prayed uh, individually was particularly uh, uh, impactful and important for all those who are present. So a particularly solemn and important moment of a feeling of, of uh, communality among all these religious leaders. So I think that was indeed a very important uh, event, but there were an, a few other uh, events during his papacy and what struck me uh, particularly was when he uh, spoke um, at St. Patrick's Cathedral um, at the end of a very long day where he had spoken to Congress first and then traveled and then got to New York and all the hype in New York and then at St. Patrick's Cathedral before he, he gave his, his sermon or at the very beginning of his sermon 
unprompted, I, it wasn't in his text, I'm sure, the very first thing he said was to congratulate Muslims on the feast of, of the sacrifice of Eid. So that was the very first thing he said. The second thing he said was to express his condolences for the 700 pilgrims who had just passed away uh, who were uh, in the middle of the Hajj. You know, I found that you know, particularly moving for him to start his, uh, his address to mostly Catholic religious by reaching beyond them and, and expressing his condolences and his congratulation uh, towards Muslim. Another, I think, very, very touching and very meaningful uh, moment. And then the third moment that I, I don't think anyone heard about and I only heard about recently was when he was in Philadelphia, he went to um, St. Joseph's University, the Jesuit University there, and um, our friend and colleague Phil Cunningham had just commissioned a gigantic statue of uh, ecclesia and synagogue, beautiful, very big statue that's just outside of the church at St. Joe's, and the Pope, uh, apparently unprompted, went to the statue and blessed it. Um, so again, a very important, I think, uh, symbolic moment. Uh, to get back to what Ken was saying, apparently people all went to the statue and started rubbing it and blessed themselves <laughs> with the holy water <laughs> that, that was uh, uh, used then. But, um, but at least sort of these are, I think, a very important symbolic expressions of um, what the Pope's uh, uh, relationship is to uh, other religious traditions. Um, and I think there is a message behind all these symbolic actions also. Um, I think the first message is, is one of the importance of interreligious friendship. And for the Pope, that is absolutely central, I think, to everything he uh, does. And uh, we've heard it already, sort of his personal relationships and friendships uh, inform everything he does. And he exemplifies that also in the way he acts and, and engages with uh, other religious traditions. And personally, I've become also more and more convinced of the importance of inter-religious friendship as the, as, the, as the very basis for all dialogue and peace between religions and understanding and so forth. So, you know, all of the work that is being done by Interfaith Youth Corps, I think I'm becoming more and more convinced of, of the importance of this. And I think uh, Pope Francis really exemplifies this also. Another point, uh, or another part of his message is, is the respect for difference. And I will read you uh, the text uh, he uh, spoke when he was at Ground Zero. And I think that's also a very powerful text because when we think of, of interreligious dialogue, we often tend to go to what we find that is similar in the other or what joins us together. But this is what Pope Francis had to say. For all our differences and disagreements, we can experience a world of peace. In opposing every attempt to create a rigid uniformity, we can and must build unity on the basis of our diversity of languages, cultures, and religions, and lift our voices against everything which would stand in the way of such unity. Together we are called to say no to every attempt to impose uniformity, and yes to a diversity accepted and uh, reconciled. So you see here in, in his very prayer at Ground Zero, he emphasized the importance of unity in diversity as the basis uh, for peace between religions. Again, I think a very uh, important uh, message. The, uh, the, the next message I think is, and that's one that he has also constantly emphasized, is the importance of collaboration uh, between religions in, in the alleviation of suffering and peace and economic advancement and, and uh, uh, joining to, uh, to help people in, in, creation, in situations of oppression and, uh, and difficulty. Uh, so in, in all of his texts, he has emphasized the importance of uh, serving justice uh, and, and peace as the basic principle of all our exchanges. That is what he uh, also um, said in uh, Evangelii Gaudium, one of his first uh, important uh, uh, texts. And then finally, um, what I find very striking in Pope Francis uh, that certainly was not very uh, much at the forefront of Pope uh, Benedict and maybe not even uh, of Pope John Paul II who was very interested in interreligious dialogue is that Pope Francis really does emphasize the possibility of learning from one another. 
not just learning about one another or, or creating friendship, but learning about from the other religious traditions. So interreligious dialogue, not only as a friendly exchange, but as an opportunity for us also to grow in the truth ourselves. And he says that, um, uh, I'm sorry, let me um, uh, go to the text. Uh, in Evangelii Gaudium, for example, he says, true openness involves remaining steadfast in one's deepest convictions clear and joyful in one's identity, while at the same time being open to understanding those of the other party and knowing that dialogue can enrich each side. Knowing that dialogue can enrich each, each side. In the previous paragraphs, he also uh, emphasized that possibility of really learning from one another. And I think that is uh, also an important part uh, of uh, his message, of course, Pope Francis also continues to emphasize the importance of pro proclamation, which is part of the essence of, of Christian faith, but he does that in a way that includes dialogue that doesn't um, uh, regard dialogue as a secondary uh, uh, mandate, but as in, an integral part of uh, the, the missionary mandate of, of the church. So. Um, but in conclusion, what I, uh, what I see is, is what we have with Pope Francis is really a return to the kind of optimism and openness that we found after the Second Vatican Council and documents like Nostra Aetate, which really emphasized the, the possibility and the beauty of other religions and the responsibility of Christians to reach out to other religions, also as part of our mission, you know, sort of dialogue as mission itself. Uh, as exemplifying how uh, people from different religions can live together in the world today. And, and what I see with Pope Francis is sort of a new, a, breath, a new breath of fresh air, a new breath of return to that, uh, to that original uh, impulse after Vatican <coughs> II and, and a kind of optimism and hope for dialogue between religions. Thank you. Marvelous. Thank you, Catherine. <laughs> Three wonderful presentations. Let me invite the, uh, the panelists just for about three or four minutes uh, around the gr a good question that Ken raised, uh, will it last? Now, I, I must say for myself, I, I, I hope it will last, don't we all hope it will last? But just the note that Catherine ended on, that we've had an experience before, those of us of some vintage, and who lived through the Second Vatican Council, and remember the tremendous Elan and the Giornamento and so on that, that the Council launched. We thought nothing could stop us. As my grandmother, Robert Drester, used to say, if they can change the mass, they can change anything. And uh, so we had changed the mass and we thought that all of the renewal and reform and resourcement that the council called for was alive and well and moving forward. But I think many commentators would agree that, that, that there was a halt to that and it was certainly a tempering of that spirit. So I can well see why it's a very reasonable, even historical question to raise, will it last? Uh, now, I hope it does, and we all hope it does, at, at, uh, I mean, but there is an old joke going around that he was, he's the first Jesuit pope in 500 years, and he may well be the last Jesuit pope <laughs> for another 500 years. Hopefully not, or, or, of somebody of his ilk, whether it's a Jesuit, Dominican, or a Franciscan, can, whatever, uh, but somebody who is in continuity and who carries forward the kind of style that he, has, that he has established and the approaches and the values and the commitments that Steve has talked about and Catherine and Ken as well, that hopefully they're going to move forward. To me, it would be a difficult act, to, to, it would be a terribly difficult act to follow, but for somebody to come along and try to regress and go back to the kind of imperial trappings of papacy and what have you, it would almost seem ludicrous at this point. So, uh, but I could be naive. As I said, it happened before, it could happen again. So I'd like to hear Steve and, and Ken himself and Catherine respond briefly to the question, will it last? How might it last? How do we help it to continue and lasting um, as we move forward? So maybe a minute or two each, and then we're going to open it to the, to the uh, whole community. I, I'll comment. I'll comment to start because I don't have much to say about that. I, I, I think we all hope it lasts, but the problem is that it isn't done yet. So we don't know what's going to really happen in the future, even what's going to, hap what's going to come out of this synod uh, that's being uh, is underway now. I think it would last more deeply 
as Pope Francis lives and appoints bishops that are of the um, that are of the kind of pastoral uh, sensitivity and commitment that you see in the Archbishop of Chicago right now, Blaise Supic. And the more good bishops can be put in, uh, the more that's going to attract priests that are going to be in the image of someone who really cares about the people as the place in which they are called to serve and not try to be careerists within the Vatican or within the Episcopal hierarchy. Um, I hope, but I don't expect, that the Pope will take a better look at the issues of gender. I think really the blind spot for him is a, a really a crying need and an outrage around the world. The women are still in all cultures of the world second class citizens. And um, it seems to me that that's the area where he needs to grow. Uh, I say this in all humility. Uh, I, I need to grow there as well. Uh, but I think that it's very easy to be isolated in an all-male world and not understand the suffering that women are, are put through. And that's, to me, that's the key need, thing that needs to change in the church right now. And if not the Pope, then his successor, his successor, if they're in, his, uh, in, in the kind of stream of thinking of subsidiarity and solidarity and accompaniment that he represents. Thank you, Steve. Great point. Catherine, maybe a comment? Um, yeah, I think what, what this pope has uh, brought home is really the thirst for uh, models of spiritual wisdom and depth. You know, mm. So it's really his, his spiritual charism that draws so many people uh, to him and that gives the church, I think, a new uh, vitality. Mm. And, and I think what, what we need in the church, or what this says also in the church is, is as as Ken pointed out, we need that kind of leadership, that kind of spiritual uh, exemplar, not just in our Pope, but in all of our religious uh, leaders and priests. And, um, and so, you know, the future or the continuity of the church will depend on the, the ability to form people who have that kind of charism and who have that kind of wisdom and have something indeed to say to people in their congregations. And, and I think, you know, to rejoin what Steve just said, maybe there, there's a need to open the leadership of the church to other forms of leadership indeed, mm -hmm. that, uh, that, you know, where that, that kind of charism can be used in a much more constructive uh, way. So I think that's going to be. Thank you. Huge. Yes, Ken, would uh, you hope again? Well, I, I guess I would say there was, uh, there's some reason for hope, and then there's some, again, for me, real open questions. Uh, the reason for hope is uh, I had a conversation a couple of months ago, actually, with another one of our colleagues who's not here, who's out of town uh, this semester, but a, a colleague in the theology department, Rick Galati, who really is a fine scholar of the church. And he and I were talking, and I said, well, Rick, I love the style of this guy, but what's changed substantively? And he had a very interesting response. He said he thought the biggest substantive reform has been unnoticed by most people, and it was that, that Francis is really working at cleaning up the finances of the Catholic Church. And his point was, when you have loose money out there and unaccounted money, it leads to corruption, it leads to misuse of funds, it leads to a sort of general laziness and lack of focus because people have ways of having life go on, whether or not they work or they achieve anything or the like. He's talking about when I was theology chairman, so <laughs> <laughs> I confess. But, uh, but, but Francis is really introducing measures of accountability and really introduce, tightening up the, the way the money is, is you know, distributed and organized and accounted for. And I think that at the level, at this level of the church, that could be a lasting reform that could be significant. I think what may be going on at the synod could be a lasting reform at that level if, let's see how that goes in the next couple of weeks. But for me, the big question is this. It's what I call the 90-90 rule. 90% of Catholics, their experience of the church is their parish. Yeah. We do good things here at BC. We have nice retreat houses. We do lots of other things, but for most Catholics, 90% of their experience of Catholicism is the parish. And for 90% of that 90%, their experience of the parish is the weekend liturgy. 
And if we don't improve the way in which we celebrate and preach and gather to worship together on weekends, I, I think that's where we can stultify. Which, and that to me is the open question. Which raises the issue of the quality of priesthood and the, and the, and the quantity, not just the quantity, but the quality. A closing word from our from our sponsors from from Ken from our sponsors <laughs> <laughs> from Ken or, Coca Cola is coming in. <laughs> something on the way home that you're you're kind of saying I should have said I would have said I could have said and didn't get to say. Anything? I think for all of us in the room, um, I th just maybe to reiter reiter reiterate what we've been saying. I think it's important not to be starstruck and to recognize that Francis is a human being and we shouldn't uh, be elevating him into a, into a semi-divine being and we shouldn't be surprised when he makes mistakes and when he makes comments that we don't agree with that we think that, are, uh, that reflect a kind of myopia. Uh, he's a person, he, he's the first to say he's on the way. You know, we're all, we're all flawed human beings and uh, he's, been on a, he's been on a ride and I've been on a roll for a while uh, but we shouldn't be surprised if he doesn't accomplish the things he wants to accomplish. I think what's important is to learn about what it is to be a flawed human being seeking to follow Jesus in the church today and to do the best we can with all of our limitations, accepting God's mercy along the way. On that good note, I think we can end. Let me just recognize the sponsor for this evening's program, the Church in the 21st Century Office. This is a pause for station identification. Um, we were founded some 13 years ago by Father Leahy to be a catalyst and a resource for the reform and renewal of the Catholic Church. It looks like we'll have work to do for a while. Thank you for coming and come again.